All right, we're going to get started here in just a second. I lost internet for a brief period of time, and my phone needed a charge, so we're going to get this show on the road here in a second. Okay. A couple things I want to cover during this live stream. Um, if you guys are watching me right now, if you're not, you can watch me a little bit later on uh, after the stream is over. Uh, today's stream is going to be about some comments that were left. So I didn't get any emails, but I got a lot of comments that I want to address. And one of those comments specifically is telling me that uh, if, if I'm not willing to negotiate a deal or negotiate a price with a cash buyer, um, then I'm a jackass. That was the comment left, and I didn't delete it. And there was more to it. There was like three paragraphs. So I want to address this real quickly, okay? First off, when you pay cash for an RV and there's no trade-in, Generally, there's only one way for a dealership to make money. And that is through the price of the vehicle. Okay, so the difference figure between what you own it for and what you sell it for. So that creates a problem. Because you're now taking away two ways for the dealership to make a profit. And all businesses... I'm so sorry. I really am. I'm really sorry that you don't feel this way. But all businesses need to make a profit in order to stay in business. Now, right now, there's a big inventory dump. I'm in the middle of purging, <clears throat> trying to purge 20 units this month, 20 aged units. But I draw a line in the sand on what we're willing to lose or what we're willing to make. What's the minimum? But when I get a guy that walks in with a trade-in and pays cash, I'm more flexible and every dealership's more flexible because we look at it, okay, so if I sell this new motorhome for invoice, but I get this trade-in for wholesale book or a couple grand back of wholesale book, they're going to be more willing to negotiate the price. Because now you gave the dealership an alternative way to make some kind of money so they can make their payroll, so they can pay their bills. When you take out a trade and you take out the financing, all that leaves the dealership to make any kind of money is the selling price. So this, this, I understand that because there was five people left really rude and nasty, amazingly nasty comments to me that I'm a jackass, I'm a dumbass, that I don't deserve people that pay cash. No, that's wrong. If you're going to pay cash and you're not going to have a trade-in, then there's no other way for you to negotiate the deal. Now, where I always say, and if everybody listened to the full video that I always do, if you, the customer, are buying an older RV that is not financeable, then yes, there is some negotiation involved. But if the dealership can make a little bit of money on the financing, then they really don't want you to pay cash and they'd be more flexible about negotiating a price or negotiating their fees if you are financing the vehicle. So, I get it. I'm not like... I understand the anger. I get the anger. The anger is um, 
the anger is understandable because the truth hurts. Okay? And I get it. I'm a very transparent guy. So I understand that transparency is going to piss a lot of people off. Because customers don't always like to be told what the truth is. They say they do. But there's a small group of people in our world that don't want to be... They, they want to have some kind of fairy dust thrown on a deal. Some kind of pixie dust. Like, I magically came up with a $5,000 discount out of my butt because you're paying cash. That's what people want to hear. And I'm not that guy. I'm the transparent guy that's going to give you all the information so that way the transaction is easier for you. So the transaction's a better experience for you. Whether you buy from me or not is irrelevant. But for you to have the knowledge to go walk in with confidence in what you're purchasing, that is the most important thing to me. Okay? All right. I got a couple more. Um, let me go over here my notes. Okay, here's another comment I got. This is another comment. I'm not going to name the person or your username. If you want to go search through them, you can. Uh, here it is. Why do you hate Grand Design fifth wheels so much? It seems like every other video I hear... You tell me or compare something to Grand Design and you always say that you don't like them, but you've never done an explanation video. Please explain yourself. Okay. So this was a comment left, and, 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 it's, it, and it's fair. I explained it on my podcast. I might as well explain it here on the live stream. And for those of you that didn't make it today, I'm sorry. I'm late because the internet issues, I didn't couldn't get any kind of internet until about 15 minutes ago, and I was supposed to be on at 7 p.m. So I apologize to everybody about that. Um, so I'll explain to you. Grand Design fifth wheels, I have three main problems with, okay? Number one is they cut every corner, especially ever since Winnebago bought them. They cut every corner on the plumbing and the electrical and the holding tanks. So, I know this year in 2020, at least last year I should say, in 2023, my guys personally replaced 13 black tanks on Grand Design fifth wheels. That's reflection, solitude, momentum, etc. Now, the travel trailers, I don't have a problem with. The Transcend, the Imagine... They're actually really good products. I don't have very many complaints about Imagine because it's built similar to a Rockwood Flagstaff, built similar to a Coachman Freedom Express. So I don't have a problem with the travel trailers. But I have a problem with the fifth wheels. A really bad problem with the fifth wheels. Okay. The second reason why I don't like Grand Design is because they ruined the industry by cutting corners. Now, I hope the owners of... Now, if you don't know, the owners of Brinkley owned and started Grand Design. And I just hope that they learned their lesson from Grand Design and build a better fifth wheel in Brinkley and reestablish some construction uh, standards. Because what happened was, guys, is Grand Design, on the reflection, the solitude, and the momentum, it was all about the cabinetry. It was all about... The, the plush, the lipstick. All, every single freaking RV out there, every boat out there, it's a big pig. What they decided to do is dress it up with a lot of lipstick and then half-ass feed it. And that's, that's pretty much what sums up Grand Design fifth wheels. Not the travel trailers, but the fifth wheels, okay? So you started seeing this movement of people that went over into Grand Design, like, oh my God, hypnotized by all the gorgeous cabinetry. Oh my God. I mean, that's all you ever heard. Heartland, at the time, was building the Bighorn and Landmark, and they were ugly. But freaking ugly fifth wheels, but they were built like tanks. 
They were built with a high standard of construction. And when Grand Design started getting its market share momentum, everyone from Jayco to Forest River to Heartland to Winnebago Tobles started trying to catch up to the cabinetry instead of keeping the construction standards. And one of them that pisses me off the most is the exposed plumbing that they tell you that they tell you, oh, it's four season, but there are exposed pipes everywhere. There's no insulation behind the underbelly anymore. Heartland guys used to have a padding of insulation that they would put in the pass-through storage area where all the converter boxes, all the plumbing was. They spent the money on the actual rig to make it full-time capable. They had toll-free numbers to 24-hour technical support that they personally paid for. My boy Colby was a brilliant guy, like I, taken after the old John Crane Fifth or Fleetwood days, okay, where the ugly duckling or the ugly kangaroo, which was the bounder, didn't look very pretty, but it was built like a freaking shit brick house. And ever since Grand Design came into the picture, the quality of the build is gone to just out the window. It's gone. Right? And the third reason why is because Winnebago Towables bought them. And Winnebago Towables is the biggest piece of garbage manufacture on God's green earth. The motorhomes are the stand we used to be the standard now Newmar is really the standard but Winnebago motorized is a still a vi uh, a very highly constructed very high quality built motorhome but their towable division is garbage and it's run by unfortunately people that care more about what's going in their pocketbook than building a good product AK why they've gone such through a, such a big roller coaster ride over the last seven years. The reason why they lost a lot of sales reps over a long period of time is the construction of their units suck and now you gave them grand design to make it suck even worse. So that's the reason why I have a complete disdain for momentum, reflection, and solitude. And I've sold them guys. It's not like I haven't sold them. And if they came up to me and said, hey, I'll offer you two on your lot, I, I would have a tough time having it. I wouldn't mind having Imagine and Transcend here. The travel trailers, I wouldn't mind having. But the fifth wheels, I, I would cringe. It would, take, it would take a lot of convincing to get me to carry it on my lot. So... You want transparency? That's transparency all the way around, right? Okay, next comment. And I'm sorry, I'm trying to work with my computer. I put it up against the wall here because the reception in the area is terrible for the internet. Okay, next comment. Uh, thank you so much for all of your information. I do have a question. I'm in Florida, and I have not been able to get financed. Uh, I am over 600, putting a really good chunk of money down. Uh, can you help me? Um, email me. If you listen to this live stream, email me. I always put my email or my Instagram or my Facebook in the description box. There's a lot of complicated things. I'm not sure how much you're trying to borrow. I'm not sure uh, how much down payment you're looking to use. Don't know the dollar amount finance. I don't know the whole situation. So uh, email me and I'll email you a list of questions I look for and we'll go from there, okay? All right. Where's my, hold on just a second. I gotta get grab something real quick. Let me grab one moment, please. Ha! Grab my other, other computer. There we go. All right. Because I just got notification I got an email. Which means somebody wants a question answered. Okay. 
Oh, by the way, very interesting. Um, uh, I got in trouble with a couple friends of mine. A um, couple friends of mine from the vending side of the business that supply their suppliers for the RV factories. Uh, that's as far as I could tell you who they are. Um, let me know that Eclipse RV was not happy about me announcing that they are going out of business. Um, now, I didn't say they are. I said if anything, I want to clarify this real quick. I said if nothing else changes before February 1st, they more than likely were going to close their doors. And the reason why is because they, 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 she... Put it this way, guys, when you don't have the ability to pay your bills because you're not making any money, you, you end up not in a home, not in a car, you know, you end up not eating, you know, so you, money has to come in. It can't just keep going out. And that's the biggest problem uh, that they are having uh, in that respect. Okay, so we're logging into the Gmail account and... Let's see what this person is saying. Hi there, honey badger. You are a big piece of crap. Oh. Um, everything you said seems like a lie. I am a cash buyer. And if you don't like cash buyers, you can go to hell. Well, that's interesting. I never said I don't like cash buyers. I said uh, that it's you, you don't have a lot of room for negotiation when you're paying cash. Thanks for that email. <laughs> if I don't, so I don't get enough rude comments and emails every once in a while. Let's see, see if anybody else emailed me. Let's look in the spam file. Okay, there is somebody in the spam. Let's see what that says. Hi there, I'm sorry I missed your last live stream. I replayed it and it was very helpful. My husband and I are looking for a fifth wheel toy hauler that is under 35 feet if you take a tape measure to it, as you would say. We're not looking for a box of 35 feet. We have to be under 35 feet to fit it in our storage. But we also have to fit... Uh, the Can-Am X3 four-seater, and we took a tape measure to it. It is now, after everything we've added, 78 inches wide, and it's 14 feet 6 inches long. Everything we have gone to see in person here in Arizona ha does not fit, and we must, or at least one of our bucket list items is to have a slide out inside the toy hauler do you have any suggestions uh yes i have one suggestion for you go find another side by side um and that's not to be a dick okay but nothing with a slide out right now unless you go to 42 43 44 feet bumper to bumper is gonna fit that wide. So right now, you upgraded your Can Am X3. Right now, the Razor Pro R, the 4C Razor Pro R, the new one, is 77 inches wide stock. And anything that is an open cargo toy hauler, so open cargo going all the way through, no separate garage, because that's what 35 feet bumper to bumper is going to get you, uh, none of them with a slide out will fit the Pro R. Why? Because the slide out, instead of it like, okay, so the best way to describe this, so if, if you're putting the slide out in, there's usually a trap door on those slides to slide it in on the tire. Well, the problem with the Pro R that we found out was the separation between the body and the tire are not that big. So the fascia ends up slamming against the body and sticking out the slide about that much as you're going down the road. Now, what has happened is some of the uh, 
uh, like Genesis Supreme RV uh, and uh, the Forest River California stuff, Sandstorm, Stealth, and Shockwave have come up with a 78 wide uh, fifth wheel toy hauler and tow behind toy hauler that don't have any slides. So what happens is is when they're sli when you, when you're sliding this in there, okay, when you're when you're bringing it in, it's going to go where you're only going to have about a quarter of an inch on each side. So the best thing to do is not get a toy hauler that has a slide out for your toy. You're going to want on a fifth wheel toy hauler, you're going to have to get one without a slide, and then the best thing you can do is strap the suspension together to go from a quarter of an inch on each side to an inch and a quarter on each side on the front tires. That way when you're going down the road, it's not going to hit, the tire is not going to hit the bottom of the wall or hit the cabinet. So the best, you're going to have to live without a slide um, if you're that wide on the Can Am X3, okay? I just actually had this conversation with a customer in person, but they bought the Pro R Razor, which is a little less wide than your Can-Am, but they only really have one option if they don't want to go to 45 feet. So oh, now there's been a lot of adapt adaptation in this, okay? A lot of adapting has occurred in the toy hauler market to the Razor Pro-R, the four-seater, which is 77 inches wide, as I said earlier, by creating a garage space that doesn't have as, as low of a loft. So the loft has been lifted, the half baths have been sunk in a little bit more, and they're going to a wider uh, separated door from the living area to the garage. But you can't go 35 feet, you gotta go 42 to 45 to get it in there, okay? So hopefully that was helpful. All right, it looks like I have a couple in here. I didn't realize, I guess everybody was waiting on me. Woo! Uh, we live in Alaska. We have been told by several of our friends that it would be a good idea to go down to the lower 48 states and buy a motor home. And that buying a motor home in such states like California, Oregon, Nevada, Arizona, etc. would give us an opportunity to not only get a better price, but to make money on the motor home when we get back to Alaska and the fact that we only have to pay $50 sales tax when we get there, no matter what the dollar amount is. This is what we've been told. But we can tell you have had some experience with a lot of out-of-state folks. What is your out-of-state experience with folks that live in Alaska? Um, okay, so first off, I'm going to put Alaska in a completely different category than any other state. Um, first off, they don't have a state sales tax. They have a county and city tax, or they call it a borough, as I was learning earlier today. Um, you, you're going to pay 6%. If you're, most of the borough and cities are, are total 6%. 3% city, 3% borough. Um I've done a lot of research on folks that live in South Dakota, Montana, Oregon, Alaska. I know what you're trying to do. You're trying to avoid paying sales tax. Nobody likes to pay taxes. I totally understand. Um, but you have to be prepared. Unless it's Oregon or Montana, um, and I can't think of the others that have zero sales tax off the top of my head. But like Oregon and uh, Montana have zero anything sales tax. So no city, no county, no state, all right? So first off, you have to have a driver's license from the state you wanna register it in. Otherwise, the dealer's not even gonna mess with you about trying to rob the government of tax, okay? You, you, as a dealership and as a business person, you want to make sure you're in business for as long as you can. So I'd rather skip a deal than try to break the law. But there's ways to go about it. So let's say you come down to Nevada and you buy from Camping World, you buy up in Reno, you buy from me, whatever the case may be. 
you get a, a, a one way trip permit to go register the vehicle. You pay your sales tax and registration in your state. Um, and that's if you're a cash buyer. If you're a finance buyer, it gets tougher. Um, it gets tougher. It's, it's hard. Um, there's a lot of times where people... Because here's the biggest problem. The biggest problem is we have to guarantee title as a dealership. And we have to make sure the bank gets the title with them as a lien holder. So we have to control that in some respects. And the only way to control it is to fill out all the docs for you properly and either mail them out ourselves or have a service, um, a business service team do it for us. So it's very hard unless you pay cash, and that's the advantage of cash buying, um, is you can sometimes avoid sales tax. Um, you know, depending on how you deal with things. You know, I don't want to know after you give me a check if you want to go rob the government of their taxes. Once I've made sure my compliance is in order and that I can't can't come back and get me, uh, I don't have a problem with you doing anything. But Alaska, and, and then the second part of your question is, I don't I don't know how you make money on a, a depreciating asset. I've had a lot of clients and customer or customers that come from like Anchorage and and different parts of the, the uh, peninsula of Alaska, deep forest stuff, very northern part by the Arctic Circle area. And the majority of them, I've kept in touch with them over the years, not one of them has told me they've made money selling their RV. Majority of the time they tell me they break even because the shipping cost from the factories to the Alaska RV dealerships is super expensive. Um, more expensive by far than from Indiana to California, which is the most expensive state to ship to in the, as you would call the lower 48. So I wouldn't plan on making money. Okay, I, I would plan um, on breaking even. I mean, I think you could sell it for what you owe on it or sell it for what you bought it for in the first two or three years because of what the shipping cost is to go from Indiana to Alaska. So just keep that in mind um, as, you're, as you're going through your process. I mean, you don't buy a new motorhome from any lot and then turn around and sell for more money as a used piece. That just that doesn't occur. And doesn't make sense. I've seen people who sell it for what they paid for it, but I've never seen people pay sell it for more than they paid for. Okay. All right, I got time for one more. Let's see. Oh, that's right. Let me go back to my comments section real quick. I got time for one more. I got time for one more. We're gonna go to a comment because I didn't see any more emails. Comments. Here we go. Uh, nice camper. It seems most RV manufacturers set their toilets so there is less room on one side than the other. Why can't they center them? Now, I replied saying no idea, but you actually got me thinking. I have no clue. I'm a big I'm a big believer that the bathroom has to be as comfortable or more comfortable than the bedroom. Because the bedroom really you're going into the bedroom of an RV to go to sleep. You're not going in there to go do what you do at your house. Well, sometimes you do if you get my drift, but for the most part you're going, when you're traveling and you're going camping, the bed, like I, I, I sleep in a queen size bed here in this travel trailer, but the bedroom's not like a hangout spot. The bedroom's a place to go to bed. The bathroom needs to be comfortable because you're doing something technically uncomfortable in there. And I'm not just talking about doing your business on the toilet, I'm also talking about showering. 
when you're in a tight claustrophobic area, it makes you feel, it doesn't make you feel good. It makes you feel rushed. It makes you feel like you can't really like just lay back and do what you got to do. And, um, and I don't know why they don't center. Now I don't mind them having at an angle. I like the angle. I, I filmed a, uh, a Flagstaff Microlite travel trailer, and everything in the coach is great except for the bathroom. The bathroom just feels like you're in a sardine can, right? And it's like I, I couldn't buy a unit like that. Even this one that I that I I'm staying in right now, the toilet in the Sundance is in a terrible spot. You feel like you're in like I I used it one time, and I'm like. Get me out of here. I felt like I was in an enclosed box, you know. Um, I'd rather go into the office and unlock the door, turn off the alarm, and you do my business there. Um, so I, I think the bathroom needs to be more important than the bedroom. I'd rather have a side bed where i got to crawl over somebody to go to the bathroom than to have a walk-around queen bed in a bathroom that feels like you're inside a prison cell. Um, so I, I like it. You know what? I'm, we're on a roll with this. I'm going to do a few more comments. I'm going to do a few more. Let's see. All travel trailers are cheaply made. No, they're not. Not all. That's bullshit. A bunch of old technology. Propane fridge, hot water tank. All the new units have 12-volt fridge and tankless hot water heater. Inverter prep, ha ha, useless. Put an inverter in. Okay, cool. So first off, tankless hot water heaters, piles of junk. That's why a lot of manufacturers went away from them. Now, tankless hot water heaters in an RV are cheaper than the propane electric ones, the 6 and 10 gallon ones. So they're being cheap and stripping the unit down. But they're making it sound so cool with a tankless. I got to do a video on that. I really do. I got to do a video on tankless hot water heater versus propane electric. I, I really like need to do that. 12 volt refrigerator. Good luck because if your solar and batteries die, guess what? You have no cold thing. Now, I have to get used to 12 volt refrigerators because 12 volt refrigerators are pretty much going to dominate the industry 100% uh, by the end of 2025. Propane electric refrigerators are pretty much going to be a thing of the past by the end of 2025. So I'm going to have to get used to it. But I still like the propane electric refrigerator. Old technology sometimes is the best technology. Just to let you know. Uh, that's all personal. I don't want to get into personal with somebody else's. We purchased a Brinkley Model Z 3610 in December. Salesman said that prices were going to go up in 20, 2024. I'm happy that you are reflecting that statement or that sentiment. We fully optioned it, and the options were basically free with dealer incentives. Well, I hate to tell you this. There is no dealer incentives. They just were willing to discount it because they probably needed a deal. You know, a lot of times when you do a factory order... Uh, a lot of times a dealership, if you're, if you know exactly what you want, color, all that stuff, sometimes a dealership will take a smaller deal on a factory order than they would say on a, on a unit on the lot. Um, because there's no cost to it. I think people don't realize that. When units sit on the lot, yes, it costs you money to have them sit on the lot, but that means you sometimes need to make more money. There was a, a, a company, a, a dealership back in the day called Altman's, and uh, I actually finally got to meet a few guys that actually worked there. And Altman's, even though they did have inventory on the ground, they mainly did factory orders with Safari, Motorhomes, uh, Beaver, um, and, um, uh, American coach before American coach went to, uh, Mike Thompson's. 
uh, and and just to hear like they if a customer came in they wanted you to match a price that was by the factory um, you know they would say okay we'll do it on a factory order if you finance it if you're paying cash and you have to have the one a lot we're not we're not going to negotiate so a lot of people made a lot of orders is one of the real interesting business um, plans out there was they were strictly mostly a factory ordered dealership they'd have maybe 30 40 pieces on the lot and then they would simply just sell you factory orders uh what we call um uh what we call uh basically factory sold units now they went out of business because that business model doesn't really keep up with you but i would tell you that at the end of the day uh, there is no there is no dealership incentives. They just were willing to take a lot smaller deal. Um, but hey, I like the fairy dust. I like the magic. I'm not like that. I haven't been like that in a long time. I hated it when I had to be like that. God, I hated that. I hate I hated so bad when I had to like. You know, I don't mind being the fairy godmother of financing. Like, I, I, I sprinkle a lot of magic and pixie dust on the financing to get loans for people sometimes. Especially folks that don't have such great credit. And, and when I run into really good people that are hardworking folks that, you know, have been struggling with their credit, it makes me even want to work harder to get them a loan. But when it, came to sell, when it comes to selling them, I have a rough time... Like creating st bullshit stories about something. I, I, I can't tell you that everything's so amazing and wonderful. I mean, I just, I don't have it in me. Um, but I do want to say one thing before I go. I want to talk, and it's going to take me a few minutes, but I want to talk about something that Miles RV said. If you guys don't follow Miles, he's out of Texas, if I remember right. He said something and he took away my thunder because I was working on a video I was going to release last week of this month about half ton towable fifth wheels and he kind of took my fire out of my sails. So I'm a little pissed at him. Not in a bad way, just kind of like, really dude? Like, could you talk to a brother before you release that video? Because now when I release it, it's not going to sound as dramatic. Um... But I really want to put into context that if you want a fifth wheel and you have a half ton truck, best piece of advice I can give you is don't buy the fifth wheel until you have a three quarter ton truck. I don't care if it's a little 28 footer that has one slide and weighs 7,000 pounds. Do not tow any size fifth wheel with a half ton truck it is the most dangerous thing you could put you and your family through and let me explain why when you're on a tow behind they have a tow rating from the hitch to the rear of the trailer they have a rating it is separate from any other measurement on the truck all right. When you go to a fifth wheel, you now have to pay attention to total payload. Okay. So here's an example. Most half ton trucks have a 1,500 to 2,000 pound payload, depending on how you option it out. All right. The pin weight, not the hitch weight, the pin weight of most fifth wheels is minimum 1,400 pounds. That's for the smaller, lighter weight stuff, okay? That's when you put water and food and clothes and supplies. Now, now you have to load yourselves. Most men average 200 pounds. Most women, 130 pounds. So that's 330 pounds. If you got two children, they're 50 pounds. That's 430 pounds. Now you're at 1,800 plus fuel plus anything you have in the vehicle, plus any extra options that you put on the vehicle, plus the weight of the hitch. So what happens is when you're going down the road, okay, there's a chucking motion that occurs 
with the fifth wheel and the fifth wheel hitch when it's locked into place. So if you have a weight distribution hitch on a travel trailer, you hear snap, crack, snap, pop, you hear kinds of noises. With fifth wheels, it chucks back and forth. So if you're going downhill, even if it's a slight downhill or a really good incline, and you have a half ton truck, that fifth wheel is going to constantly push against your truck going downhill. If you're going uphill, it's going to hit the back and you're going to be pulling while it's chucking. It's not safe. Go buy a gasoline F-250 or Chevy 2500. Get the bigger truck that has the bigger payload capacity. That way you and your family are safe. Uh, it is absolute bullshit when a fifth wheel to manufacturer calls something half ton towable. They should be sued for labeling any fifth wheel half ton towable. Okay, so I want to make sure you understand that. I may tell you in stickers, if you listen to my walkthrough videos, I will tell you in my walkthrough videos that if they, the factory tells you it's half ton towable, but I don't recommend it. You'll hear that from me every single time to acknowledge the manufacturer says it is, but then turn around and tell you what reality is. And where this comes from, this last thing on this, and I'm going to go, go to bed. A long time ago when the Ford EcoBoost, the big EcoBoost first came out, I had a guy with airbags. He set up his whole F-150 specifically for a fifth wheel. It was a 24 foot uh, with two slides, weighed 7,500 pounds dry. Uh, and I was excited because I didn't know any better. Back then I, I was a rookie, okay? I had no, no inkling. I was just, I just went by what the factory rep told me. And so anyway, these folks bought this fifth wheel in this truck. Their first trip, they go up the Rocky Mountains. They go from California, they go to the Rocky Mountains, and they are coming down on a downslope. I don't remember what city or town or anything, but they're coming on a downslope, and they couldn't stop the fifth wheel. They couldn't stop the fifth wheel on a downhill. Even with the electric brakes jammed on it, it kept skipping and stuttering going down the thing and the truck just couldn't handle the pressure. Because remember, the pressure is down the bed of the truck and pushing forward on you. It's not like a travel trailer where it's sitting on the back and held still by bars. This is a loose pin that is locked into lock jaws. So it moves around. They end up flipping the truck and the fifth wheel. Now, thank God that she was only in a wheelchair with a broken leg and that no permanent damage was done to them and they were paid out very handsomely. But let me tell you something. After that occurred, I would, every time someone comes in with a Toyota Tundra, an F-150, a Chevy 1500, a Ram 1500, a Nissan Titan, and they tell me they want to tow a fifth wheel, and that I can't convince them otherwise, I move on and let another salesperson deal with them. Because I don't want that on my conscience. I just don't. I already have one bad experience with it. I don't need a second. Fool me once, shame on you manufacturers. Fool me twice, that's shame on me. Okay. I'm going to do a full video on the fifth wheel, uh, half ton towable fifth wheel and why I know it's bullshit uh, at a later date. Hopefully I'll have it released by last week of January. I'm going to kill Miles for taking my thunder away from me, but that's okay. Uh, if he's hearing me, if he's if he's at all watches this later, shout out to you, Josh the RV Nerd. I know you've changed a lot over the last year and a half since Bish has bought your dealership, your family's dealership. And uh, believe, believe me, buddy, I understand why you are not as transparent as you used to be. I get it, especially after I've been told. Um, and uh, just want to let you know, man, I'm going to take those reins for you so you can keep doing what you're doing. And I'll just start slapping people in the face with the truth. Because they call me the honey badger. 
Anyway, guys, thank you so much for joining me on this live stream. If you're seeing this afterward, in the description box below, I'm going to link a video I did uh, that talks about cash versus financing um, that I did about a year ago, just so that way you guys have an understanding of why I always say that paying cash for a RV or any vehicle, even a car or a boat, is not a smart idea. Have a great night. Have a great weekend. Enjoy NFL Sunday and Monday.